This is in the middle of a long sermon by Moses. Speaking the words of God to God's people assembled before him. On the banks of the Jordan River, as they were preparing to enter the promised land that they had been searching for for 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Beginning with verse 1, you are the sons of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves or make any baldness on your foreheads for the dead. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. You shall not eat any abomination. These are the animals you may eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roebuck, the wild goat, the ibex, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. Every animal that parts the hoof and has the hoof cloven in two and chews the cud, among the animals you may eat. Yet of those that chew the cud or have the hoof cloven, you shall not eat these the camel, the hare, and the rock badger, because they chew the cud but do not part the hoof, are unclean for you. And the pig, because it parts the hoof but does not chew the cud, is unclean for you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. Of all that are in the waters you may eat these. Whatever has fins and scales you may eat. And whatever does not have fins and scales, you shall not eat. It is unclean for you. You may eat all clean birds, but these are the ones that you shall not eat. The eagle, the bearded vulture, the black vulture, the kite, the falcon of any kind, every raven of any kind, the ostrich, the night hawk, the seagull, the hawk of any kind, the little owl and the short-eared owl, the barn owl and the tawny owl, the carrion vulture and the cormorant, the stork, the heron of any kind, the hoopoe, and the bat. And all winged insects are unclean for you. you shall not, they shall not be eaten. All clean winged things you may eat. You shall not eat anything that has died naturally. You may give it to the sojourner who is within your towns that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Thus far, our Old Testament lesson. Please turn now to Matthew 15. Beginning with verse 1. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God? You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? 
He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone, they are blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Lord God, we ask for your help in understanding a text that is a little bit confusing and hard to apply in our day as according to our limited understanding, we need your help. We thank you that your word is true for you have given it and you have preserved it. Pray that you would make our hearts ready to receive it. That you would open our eyes by faith that we might behold Christ. That you would unplug our ears that we would hear him. That you would cause the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts to be pleasing In your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Before we begin our sermon this morning, I wish to make a public service announcement, especially geared to the men. Today is the first Sunday in February, and that means Valentine's Day is right around the corner. One common way of celebrating in our culture is to go out to dinner at a nice restaurant. So you need to make your reservation early. Now the good news is that we don't all like the same kind of food, so we're not likely all to clog up the same restaurant and block one another from eating, but still the same. You may wish to uh, make your reservation soon. Our Old Testament text with its discussion of menu might seem to be providentially helpful with its discussion of menu choices, except for me and my love of seafood, of which some of my favorite dishes are shrimp, lobster, and swordfish, all of which are prohibited. Now this would be bad news for me, except for the Old Testament lesson, or New Testament lesson, where Jesus replies basically that all foods are clean because what comes in just passes out through the stomach. And in one of the other Gospels that Jesus in fact does say, or the Gospel writer makes the comment, and thus Jesus declares, declared all foods clean. Now the fact that all foods are now declared clean uh, is good news for my eating, but in a way it's bad news for my sermon because somehow I have to explain how what Moses said in Deuteronomy has effect and value for you here 
today. Because in a way it seems almost irrelevant before I start. Except the good news is that 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And the all Scripture spoken of there is primarily has in view the Old Testament, which includes Deuteronomy. So that brings us back full square to our sermon text for this morning, validating it as profitable for us, yet perhaps confusing and maybe irrelevant for our application. So what are we going to do? Well, we begin by looking at our text carefully in its proper context to discern what the Lord is saying to us today. Moses here is preaching to God's covenant people. They finally have gotten to the border of the promised land. He wants to prepare them for going into the promised land, a land where they would be free from enemies, where they might live at peace and in abundance and serve the Lord and serve one another all the days of their life in order to prepare them for entering the promised land, he reminds them of the covenant that God made at Sinai with them, where he gave to them the heart of his covenant commitment with them, the ten words, or as we call them, the ten commandments. Now he, remind, he explained all the background in Deuteronomy 1 to 4, in Deuteronomy 5, he repeats the Ten Commandments and that covenant that was made at Horeb. And now the rest of his sermon is basically an unfolding and an application of what it means to live in that covenant with God. And he does so basically in the order of the Ten Commandments, so that chapters 6 through 11 focused on God as the only God, no other gods before them. And, and chapters 12 and 13 seem to focus on the worship of God and the right worship, worshiping the way that God wanted to worship. And now here... As we come to chapter 14, we really are addressing the third commandment in its application to us. Now, Alan Harmon notes that the third commandment is, quote, not only in regard to speech about God, Rather, it concerns living as the people of God and not bearing the character of God in a hypocritical way. So when you take not the name of the Lord your God in vain, or you don't bear the name of the Lord your God in vain, it's not just about what you're saying about God or the way you speak of God, it's also the way you live as one bearing God's character, and name by identifying with God. Now, it helps us, too, that when we look to Leviticus 21, verses 5 and 6, it points directly in the direction of the third commandment. Leviticus 21, 5 and 6. They shall not make bald patches on their heads, nor shave off the edges of their beards, nor make any cuts on their body. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God. For they shall be holy. So,
it's very important as we look at this text to not get lost in the trees so that we fail to see the forest. We need to back off a little bit, even though we have lots of questions about all these individual items, but we need to see it in its whole. And when we back off a little bit, we notice that in verses 1 and 2, there is an emphasis on who the people of God are. You are the sons of the Lord your God makes reference to funeral practices, and it goes on to say in verse 2, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. But then again in verse 21, he goes back and he says, at the end, middle of verse 21, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. So everything that is between verse 2 and verse 21 is framed by the idea that we are a people holy to the Lord. Those that Moses was preaching to were a people that were holy to the Lord. And to be holy means to be set apart. They were set apart to the Lord their God. And so the entire discussion of funeral practices and dinner options is set in the context of living as the holy people of God. A holy people will demonstrate a holy lifestyle. And so the primary concern here is not so much grieving or eating. The primary concern is that we would live as holy people. There's a certain sense in which discussing grieving practices and eating practices encompasses pretty much all of life. The one has to do with dying. The other has to do with living. How do we keep on living? We eat. What happens when people die? That raises other questions. How do we react when people die? And there is the whole section begins with a very strong emphasis on realizing and remembering that we are God's holy people. Verse 14 literally in the Hebrew says, sons are you to the Lord your God. Verse 2 says, holy people are you to the Lord your God. The emphasis is on being sons, on being holy. And so we need to read everything here in terms of our identity of who are we as God's people. And there are four descriptors here about who they were. Sons of the Lord, holy to the Lord, chosen of the Lord out of all nations, and the treasured possession of the Lord. That is who God made the people there, and that is who God has made us to be. And so, as children of God, for example, in the very beginning of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 1, verse 31, he said, You have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son. There's a reference to being a child of God. That's how God has carried you as a man 
your son. And then in Deuteronomy 8. It speaks of the sonship, of being a son of God. Verse 5, know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So there, there has been this emphasis on the people of God being a son of God. Back in Exodus, Moses went into Pharaoh and says, these are God's people and God will bring his son out of Egypt. And these are a holy people. So God wants, Moses wants the people to understand when you cross into the land, you are going as the holy people of God. You are going as the sons of God. You carry his name. You are a treasured possession of God. You were chosen out of all the earth. So how are you to live? What kind of lifestyle are you to have? Well, first of all, when you bury your dead, you don't act like the rest of the world. You don't act like the pagans. What do the pagans do? They cut themselves. They shave hair off their head. They grieve. They get out of control. You don't live that way. These are the Canaanite customs. We saw that in 1 Kings 18 when the priests of Baal, they're calling on God to show up at the altar. And you'll remember they were cutting themselves and, and causing their blood to flow. It, it was an attempt to try to gain control over God, trying to identify and relate in some way to the dead people. And, and God says, I don't want you to have anything like that with reference to the way that pagans treat death because you are my holy people and you're not like the pagans. The Apostle Paul later would say, we grieve as men not without hope in 1 Thessalonians. We're not to grieve like people who have no hope. Our hope is in Christ, in our Messiah. And so he's saying, the, in the way you face death, you're not to be like the pagans around you. We already saw that passage in Leviticus 21, where he says, you are to be holy, to not profane the name of God. So that's the end of life. Well, what about the rest of life? Well, the rest of life is eating and sleeping and then doing whatever we want to do. The reason we sleep is we're tired from our eating. And so God here gives some direction. And he begins by saying, you shall not eat any abomination. Now, he has just used the word abomination with reference to the people. He's used it in reference to the wicked people that they were facing. I is blurry. I... But he is, has already made reference to the pagans as an abomination. The word abomination instantly draws reference to the Canaanites and their practices. 
And that is at the head of the whole discussion of eating. And so why is all this discussion of food? Well, he's using food in order to draw a distinction. From the, everybody has to eat. But he's saying even in the matter of something as mundane as eating, you are to have a distinct lifestyle. You are holy to your God. And so he speaks of food either being clean that you can eat or unclean that you need not touch at all. And it, he's drawing from Leviticus 11 where God makes a distinction between the kind of foods that his people could eat. Now, the idea of clean and unclean food did not begin in Leviticus 11 when God called his people out as his people. It goes back to the time of Noah, when Noah took six pairs of clean animals on the ark, but only one pair of unclean animals, the reason being the clean animals would be used in order to make sacrifice to the Lord. And it's interesting that in discussing the three kinds of food groups, he draws back from Genesis 1 and the three realms. You have the land creatures, you have the sea creatures, and you have the creatures in the birds and wind, winged insects of the air. And that basically covers the whole world. So he's pointing to our holiness to live before God in a way that pleases God through all, the, all of life. No matter what you eat, it's a matter of holiness. And indeed, every time we eat, we are to eat as those who are holy to the Lord. We are to think about that. We are making a statement. That's what he was saying to them. You are making a statement to the pagans around you by what you eat. And we know this to some extent. Culturally, different people in different cultures eat different things. They have different flavors. Now, we struggle with the particulars here. Why did God choose certain animals to be clean and, and other animals to be unclean? And there are a variety of answers that people have offered. That certain animals you don't want to eat because it's not very healthy for you to do that. You can get trichinosis from pigs, for example. Some of the birds that eat carrion, they, um, you don't know what kind of diseases they're going to get from eating dead bodies that have been lingering for who knows how long and who knows what they died of. And so you eat these birds, you get what they eat, and you might get sick. But there's no consistency here throughout these about hygiene. It doesn't say because of hygiene. And in fact, at the end, God makes the allowance. If you find a dead animal, you can give it to the aliens. It's an act of mercy that something that you can't eat, you can let them eat. So it... It's not about hygiene. God isn't saying the way you're going to get victory over your enemies is by giving them poisoned food to eat. It's not about hygiene. There may be hygienic elements that God chose in, in making uh, his choices. Some suggest that it has to do with the uh, totems for different religions, that there were certain of these animals that were unclean that were, for example, the pig was a, a, an Egyptian god symbol, and so were some of the other animals. But it's not consistent across the board. So is it a religious thing, 
Well, it do, he doesn't say that. He's just telling us and making a distinction about what they might eat and couldn't eat. Some have suggested that it's a little more symbolic. For example, in the birds, a lot of the birds are night birds. The bat, the owls, night is darkness over against the light. But others of the uh, forbidden birds, eagles and hawks, they soar through the light. So uh, that doesn't seem to fit either. Some suggest it has to do with animals that are eating blood. And the, for God and his people, they weren't to eat blood. The life of the creature was in the blood. God alone has the power of life and death. Therefore, you don't eat the blood. That's why you don't eat animals that died naturally because their blood hasn't been properly drained from them. And so, uh, but... And they point to the fact that most of the cud chewers eat only grass. They don't eat animals. But again, it's not consistent across the board. Some people point to the, uh, the fish that don't have scales as being predominantly crabs and mollusks that are all in the mud, and the mud is dirty. Well... Again, that doesn't, uh, there's no consistent pattern for discerning why are these particular animals clean and why are other animals unclean other than the fact that God has said these animals may be eaten and these may not be eaten. And this is what will identify you as my people. God, in a sense, is building a new culture so that when people look at, so that when the nations look at this group of people, they will see a different pattern for eating that is different from their own they will see visibly something different about these people. That's what Moses is saying to the people. You are meant to live as a holy people, dedicated to your Lord. So you listen to his word, and you live according to the way that he tells you. That's how you are to go into the land. Live according to the direction that God is giving you. Now then people say, well, when Jesus came along and said that the food laws don't apply anymore, and when Peter went and had a vision of all the unclean animals being dropped and raised and dropped and raised and dropped and raised and three times means this is big news, and God said, what I call edible can no longer be declared inedible. And so Peter understood that it wasn't a matter of the food laws anymore. But you see, even there, and even for Jesus, it wasn't about the food itself. Jesus' concern was not merely for what they eat. He says what you eat comes in the stomach and it goes out. What matters is the moral issues of the heart. That's how you are to be revealed. The cultural differences between people no longer apply because as Christ made clear through his ministry, while he came for the Jews first, he also came for the Gentiles. He came in fulfillment of Abraham's promise that in Abraham, all people would be blessed. And so therefore, where the uh, nationalistic differences no longer applied, the food could be eaten because it was no longer a marker of who belonged to the Lord. The, the marker 
which was really the marker all along, is that your heart should affect the way you live. And the way you live would bear testimony to the Lord your God. In Romans 12, Paul writes, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, we are to be transformed from the inside out. And so that people would live and see us as a different people. Peter, in 1 Peter 1, verse 14, speaks in a similar way as Paul. He says, as obedient children, and notice the emphasis there on children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear through the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. To the people who were gathered in front of the Jordan, ready to enter into the promised land, they were God's chosen people. They were sons and daughters of God. They were his treasured possession. And therefore, they were to be that in the eyes of the people. All around them, they were meant to attract the people around them because they would be the hope of the world according to the promise given to Abraham. And that is what we are. Because the hope of the world, according to the promise of Abraham, was found in Jesus. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we might be saved. It is Christ and Christ alone. And so how are people going to see Jesus in us only as our hearts are changed and from that our lives are lived? for his glory. You know, the same four descriptors that Moses uses of the people in Deuteronomy 14, 1 and 2 are the same descriptors that are used of us as God's people. We are sons of God, Romans 8 speaks of that. And and 1 John 3, Behold what manner of love the Father has given us, that we should be children of God, and that is what we are. We are children of God. In the passage I read in Peter, we are to be holy because God is holy. We are God's chosen and elect. Paul speaks of this extensively in Romans, especially Romans 9, 10, and 11, but also in parts of Romans 8 and in Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. Chosen before the foundation of the world. Why, we were chosen in love to be holy in his sight. And we are God's treasured possession. We are God's chosen people a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, this is from 1 Peter 2, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are meant to be a display to the world that we belong to God that we have been adopted as sons and daughters. We are meant to bear the family resemblance. And that's basically what they were told in Deuteronomy 14. 
You're to be holy. This is how you're to die. This is how you are to live in your eating. You are to be holy. We may not be able to explain each detail on why this animal was chosen and this wasn't. And in a point of fact, a lot of the precise identifiers for the animals are not fully known, especially among the birds, but including some of the other creatures. What matters is that God has said it. What matters is that we are not to follow the way of the world. We are not to engage in abominations and do that which is offensive to God. But we are to delight in the God who sent his son to make us sons. And we are to show our joy through our obedience and our love and our zeal for him. So whether you want to eat shrimp or perch, go for it. It's no matter a distinction between you and the unbeliever. But how are we to be distinguished? by what comes out of our hearts. May God indeed let his image be revealed through the way our lives are lived so that people do recognize that we're different. Not by being obnoxious, not by eating strange foods that they don't eat and avoiding normal foods that they do eat, but by something more arresting. Lives filled with joy in a world filled with sorrow because of a Savior filled with love who came for our salvation. God was the God who rescued Israel out of Egypt. And he brought them to a place that was meant to be their promised land, a safe place. God is calling people out of this world around us to himself. And we, his people, need to reflect his love and grace so that they might find him and know him and love him and have a new identity as children, chosen children, holy children of the living God. May we be what God has called us to be and may we honor him who deserves all honor and glory. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we confess the food items in Deuteronomy 14 are confusing when we first look at them. We confess we don't understand all of the choices that you made. What matters, Lord, is that you made those choices and said, this is appropriate for you, my children my chosen children, my treasured possession children, whom I love, whom I have set apart. And that same principle holds, Lord. We are yours because you have chosen us. You have called us. And what matters is that we live according to your instruction. That's how we show that we belong to you. Not in eating and drinking. Indeed, the Apostle Paul says, whatever we eat and drink, do it all for the glory of God. May that be our lifestyle. That whether facing death or facing the daily activities of living, that we would be living for you and that you would be honored. This is our heart's desire, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.